Hey folks, welcome. I hope you're having an awesome SauceCon day. I know mine has been fabulous so far. Uh, this virtual day has been going great. My name is Danny McEwen. I'll be talking about unified testing framework for functional and performance testing. This is less of a design conversation. It's more our journey as we went down automated functional testing and how we went down performance testing and we're pretty good in both areas and we're stepping back as we holistically, how can we look at both from a quality perspective? I'm gonna turn off my video just so that it doesn't distract me or distract you from the slide content. And hopefully you don't lose audio when we do that. Okay, hopefully you can still hear me. All right, really quick about myself. Uh, I've been doing this more years than I'd like to admit. Uh, worked in all aspects of the software development lifecycle. Currently, I'm a test automation architect at Paychex. And I focus on continuous delivery. I also teach in the evenings at RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. In the fall, I teach software engineering class. And in the spring, I actually teach a test engineering class. And it's one of the few engineering colleges I know that teach software testing. So that'd be nice if there's more colleges time goes on that actually teach software testing um, as a skill set. Very involved in an industry, uh, such as speaking as a guest speaker at like conferences like this. And you have my LinkedIn as well. Paychecks. Uh, really want to focus on the third bullet down the 670,000 clients that we support. That really translates to about 12 million workers. And also it translates to about $700 billion we transfer annually. And that's important because I'll, I'll bring that back up in a, in a couple slides from now. But first, I would just like to do a quick uh, polling question so I have an idea of the experience of my audience. So if you could just take a minute and answer these, really the first ones on functional automated testing, it could be you and or your company. And the second question is performance testing, and it can be you or your company. And I look at one to two, kind of a beginner stage, three to five intermediate, and five plus is advanced. It's gonna wait for those numbers to settle down. They're still moving. Still coming in. Okay. All right. I will give it another. Oh, looks like we're still got a little more. Okay, like five more seconds. And there's no right or wrong answer. Okay. In the sake of time, I will end the poll question now. Thank you for doing it, by the way. Okay, it's just so I can share with you what I'm seeing. One to two years is 20%, it's so about a third. Three to five years in the functional is 26, so like close to a quarter, and five plus 36. So pretty evenly distribu distribution across all three uh, time frames. And in performance, this was a little more what I expected. The experience in automated testing is higher in the functional area than in performance. And that's typical. So the one to two years, we're at 51%. One to two years of uh, performance automated testing, 13% at three to five, and 21 at five plus. So that's, that's typical what I've seen in other places. Okay, uh, two slides were shown to me that I really liked in the, previously, and I'm gonna share these with you. I kind of recast their titles a little bit. This one's called Quality Through Data, Succeed or Fail Fast. I'm just gonna pick three areas to focus on. One is Google. So 3.8 million searches occur in 60 seconds. So just think from a quality perspective, what does that mean if they are down for 60 seconds? 
Well, many people would go to a different browser. They're not going to wait. So there's a loss of business. If we look at the 18.1 million tech set, same concept. If it's not working, there's other IM messaging platforms that you can use, either internal to your company or external. So the same thing. If it is down, the consumer has a choice to go to something else. And the last one, 188 emails sent in 60 seconds. If any email platform is down, you just have a choice to go to another platform, this Gmail, Outlook, iCloud. So just kind of pause for a second and think, what would that mean to your business? If you're down for 60 seconds on a nominal day, and then if you're down for 60 seconds at a peak time, those are the kind of questions we ask ourselves at Paychecks and make sure our applications and our infrastructure can address them in a timely fashion. It kind of gets back to that 12 million workers we're supporting and that $700 billion we are moving annually. This next slide, another one that was shared with me that I also liked, I did recast this as well. Quality through adoption succeed or fell fast. With the previous slide, is somewhat taking into account you have a previous solution up and running and you're adding features to it and maintaining it. This one's really more about introducing major solutions or platforms in a somewhat emerging space. So I'm going to take two data points from this one. The telephone, it took 50 years to get to 50 million users. If we jump down to mobile phones, it took 12 years, a third of time, to get to the same 50 million users. And when, I think we would all agree that the technology in the mobile space, it's much more advanced than the telephone space. So adoption is faster, cycle times are shorter. And if you're in this space introducing an application or infrastructure, you succeed or fail very fast. So both these slides show the window to succeed or fail can be extremely short. Another way to look at this is the uh, threshold for dissatisfaction for our customers has become very low or our satisfaction bar has become extremely high. And I think we've all felt that. So the next slide, what is productivity to continuous delivery? Well, productivity, right? It's an effective way of managing your business. And think of CD is the delivery mechanism, right? It reflects your productive practices. So what does it look like to us? Well, one is efficiency, faster, cheaper, and easier. I think the key thing about efficiency is that we recognize when something in, is inefficient. So what do we do in our CD pipeline or in our software development life cycle to address inefficiencies. You can also look at efficiency as are we waterfall, how we deliver our software or how we develop it? Are we agile? And if we're agile, are we really mini waterfall or true agile? And even with the agile, do we have separation of duties of our scrum master, our solution lead and our product owner? Because those will all contribute to efficiency or inefficiencies. Then we also look at productivity is efficiency plus quality. We all have different expectations of quality. It's somewhat based on the cost of the service or goods. But also with quality, it could be very process centric. Do we use CMMI, Lean Six Sigma? Do we use ITIL? Do we have people certified in the quality process space to help with that? So if you want to increase productivity, which is, a, which is always important in managing your business, you want to look at efficiency and quality, and we want to push that through our continuous delivery pipeline. I'm going to focus on quality. In a very narrow uh, definition right now, I'm looking at functional testing and performance testing. Because as an end user of software, if, if it's deficient in the functionality or the performance, that will translate to poor quality.
So take a look right now where we are with functional performance testing and then ask yourself, where is your company with these as well? So functional testing. Right now, we have an automated framework that's automated for the masses. It's self-service. What does that mean? That means at one point, the automation framework group actually built a framework, but also built the test scripts, ran the test scripts, and the agile development teams that looked at the results. Now, the automated framework group does is just build the framework and maintain it, and agile development teams create the scripts, decide when to run them, whether it's scheduled or on demand, and, review, and look at the results. It's completely self-service. Automated for gating, for CD gating. We look at sanity, we look at health, we look at regression and how that uh, plays through our gating process. We're scalable with vendors and IT. We're in our third generation of our automation framework, and we're actually getting ready to start designing our fourth. But our first two were very vendor-centric, one vendor, and uh, we kind of got painted in a corner and could not deliver what our business needed in a timely fashion. So we may always keep in mind, we don't want to be dependent on any one vendor at any one time. We also are keyword driven and test as code. We actually picked Python, so test as code of functional testing solutions. So we have both today. On our performance side, right now it's, it's a dedicated group of experts that create the framework create the performance scripts, run the performance scripts, and analyze them. So that they are aware functional testing was. They have a manual gating for CD, so it's not automatic in the CD pipeline. And they're still somewhat uh, single vendor centric. Uh, they cannot easily plug and play with different vendors, which can impact what they can deliver from a business perspective. So what we want to do is take the functional testing attributes that we have and copy and bring those over to our performing testing group. We want to minimize duplicating software infrastructure and the talent. It's not that the performance testing is doing anything bad. It's very good at what they do. It's just from an efficiency perspective, we have two groups that work somewhat siloed and we're not leveraging our talent, our software, and our infrastructure. So let's step back and just look at our functional testing and the evolution of what we're at on that, because that will play into our ideal performance load definition. So let's start with keyword. The business required a UI test automation tool for the testers, the ability to scale across numerous apps and technologies very easily. So that's where we started. We implemented one application. We integrated two open source solutions or frameworks. Also four additional vendors, all in one app. We made sure it was secure, being a financial uh, company. Uh, security is always a top concern. And we had scale across the enterprise. Each application is, can be and is implemented in different technologies. So we're able to go across that. Equally challenging and important and time consuming was the infrastructure they had to run on. They had 24 seven availability, parallel execution, again, secure, because some of our vendors are cloud providers. So we've outside our firewall. It had to be scheduled on demand and work within CD. So we had to do those together. I can say we've been effective because right now we are in six digits of how many test executions that we do a day. And that framework's been around, I'd say for about four, five years. Then the business change it required test automation tools for developers to flexibly to build as code. So we're shifting left just like is a test automation framework used to build the test scripts, then the agile tester and the agile teams build the test scripts. 
Now we're shifting left and having developer build the automated test scripts. We need to be light, light, lightweight with the integration of the tools. So we're basically focused on high cohesion and low coupling. Security is always more of a challenger, challenge. We have savvier uh, users and certainly people trying to get into our, our uh, systems are smarter as well. So security only gets more difficult as you open things up. Went from a one application for the tester to two boxes for the developer and testers. And I say and testers because there are testers that do want to uh, create test scripts as code. And by choosing Python being a scripting language, it was a nice bridge for them to uh, cross over if they choose to. Uh, one nice thing about the toolboxes, it allows the developers to use any IDE that they want. Um, they build it as really any other application. So that'd be end to end. And right now our adoption is in progress. So we're very excited to see how our developers embrace this new tool. And in time will tell if, uh, if it surpasses the keyword uh, implementation. Now, very important, we didn't want to throw away the infrastructure or duplicate that infrastructure. So we wanted to leverage the infrastructure for this implementation. So the two things in bold is what we had to do. So it wasn't a lot we had to add from an infrastructure perspective. We basically had to register these Python tests on our infrastructure where the keyword tests are executed. And that registration process also uh, entailed um, kind of checking what they're putting on this infrastructure because it is as code. So it's an inspection step that's done automatically. And then equally important, it allowed us to merge these Python tests with our keyword in a job. We actually submit jobs to the infrastructure and then job, a job is a collection of tests. And what you can do is you can create dependencies within the job. So if a job had 100 tests, but the first test was login and login failed, you wouldn't run the other 99 tests. So it's a, it's a way of reducing uh, false failures. So where we are today is the business ultimately requires workflow, keyword driven, and that's really coming from the adoption of RPA. We didn't plan that when we did the keyword driven, that's to find defects, but we found out our business units can use the keyword driven a tool to execute workflows, robotic process automation, and that's growing. So they still need that, but in the IT defect space, finding defects, we want to shift left to have the developer have the opportunity minimally to write automated tests. We still need to do this by providing one secure execution reporting platform. So the two are, are separate, how they evolve is test scripts, but we execute them on one platform and we can interleave the tests in one job. I go over this slide because for those that are show they were uh, only one to two years into their test automation, the functional test automation framework. They want to pick a path. Do you do keyword driven? There's pros and cons of that. Or do you do uh, test as code? And there's pros and cons of that. Or you can do both as we evolved. It, it all depends where do, you, where do you want to be and what makes sense to your business. And equally important, you have to consider your IT culture. You know, what, what kind of culture developers and, and testers and what kind of agile teams, assuming you're using agile, do you have? Okay, so what is an ideal performance load test? Well, is that, that as I just talked about, that functional test, single user, functional UI, but it's also a non-UI protocol load test. And that non-UI is what we typically think of when we're thinking of load tests. Right, we'd have lots of uh, protocol tests. But you really want to have both running at the same time. So let's talk about the single user performance test journey we've been on. It's performed by the performance group early on. They use auto native uh, test automation tools. So literally a timer, it would start a stopwatch before you push a button and end it after but from the test automation side, not in the code itself. 
it was a separate keyword driven test. They didn't even use the same test automation tools that the functional testers. It was a completely separate set of tools, therefore different licensing, higher costs, dupl uh, duplicating maintenance, so it was inefficient. So we wanted to address that. Only ran on certain uh, environments, performance and prod, executed behind the firewall, and it was not part of our gating, so it was post-release after, a lot of after-release analysis. That's where we were, where we are today, just like functional testing, it's shifting left. Uh, the performance folks are more in an advisory role, very much as the test automation framework folks are. Development implements the timers and marks and measures, and the output goes to Splunk. What's really powerful is these test scripts are the same test scripts that I went over on the previous page for, key, for keyword driven. They are the same test scripts. So shared keyword enterprise test. So when you edit and maintain or change one or create one, you're creating both. Also, it executes on all the tests and performance and production environments. We're still behind the firewall. And for a performance perspective, it's not still in the uh, auto gating uh, delivery pipeline, but there is pre release analysis. So we are doing it much sooner. So where do you want to go? Uh, we still see uh, performance in an advisory role. Uh, there's a special subject matter expertise in their skill set, and we don't ever see that going away. Uh, for now, the performance group continues to own the load tests, but I have some slides later on how that could possibly change. We also want to bring the, the as code or Python tests into the single user performance testing arena. So that's something we need to do. So it's just not the keyword. We also want to synchronize or orchestrate executing the single user performance test and the load execution. We'd also like to execute these single user performance tests external to the firewall. And we expect uh, Sauce Labs to be able to help us there. Currently the load tests are ex executed externally from the firewall, but the single user performance tests are not. And we absolutely want to integrate with CD gating so that as the application moves from test system to test system closer to release to production, that we have our automated quality gates are chucking the success of those tests. So functional tests help gain early insight into application performance. If you're not that mature in the performance testing arena, or you haven't taken advantage of the simplicity of doing single user performance testing, uh, I suggest consider that. It's, it's a great place to start, and it's, and it's also a great place to um, add to your load tests. You do need to add marks and measures to the application itself, and you can output uh, your results into Splunk and gather them through a dashboard. Also, another benefit is if you schedule the single user performance tests to run on a periodic basis. They're also great for production monitoring. There's a lot of benefits there. So here's a blueprint to synthesize UI and non-UI performance tests. And this is only from a software test perspective. This is where we're trying to get away from having completely separate tests in the functional side and on the load side. We've already combined the single user performance tests and the functional test as one test, but we're not satisfied. We're saying, can we do something with the, with the functional test and or the load test so they're more one script? When you make a change in one, you see it in both. So that's the challenge we have. So you have the UI functional test, and that's that single user performance test and your nine UI load test. And you can pick the open source tool of your choice. Right now we're focusing on Selenium and Appium for the functional and for the load, JMeter and Locus. And the first thing you wanna look at is how can I correlate running the few functional tests with, with the load? And you don't have to have these be the same script to do this. So regardless, this is something you wanna look at. So on the UI functional test, you may have as many as one to 10 of these tests running. We're on the 
load side, you could have a thousand to 10,000. So a big difference in numbers. Now, one of the things we did is we tried to look at how can we take the UI functional tests and transpose it over to the load? Because if you look at a load test, how is it initially created? If you take Jamie, right? You still go through a UI and create it, and then you parameterize it. So we thought, well, we can do that in software in a repeatable, automated way. We couldn't really find an easy way to do that. So we stepped back and tried to look at another approach. And the approach we're going now today is we're looking at a domain specific language approach. So we're writing some higher level scripting script, test script, and have that produce the functional test script and the non UI load tests. We haven't done it yet. You know, it's not straightforward, but we see it more promising than trying to transpose either the functional test to the load test or the load test to the functional test. And we don't expect this to be necessarily on every health standard regression script. We, we see this being really impactful on our critical transactions. You know, the, the handful um, ones that are critical to your business that you want to keep in sync and maintain and be able to uh, execute uh, on demand anytime, both from a functional and a performance perspective and get that ideal uh, load result. So that was on the test script side. And let's see how I'm doing it. 10 minutes left or so. That might've been a while ago. Okay, tools identified to share. Uh, Storing functional performance tests in the same repository, that just makes uh, sense. Uh, it gets you mentally thinking of both. If they're coming to the same application, right now they're in separate repositories, and that keeps that separation. So bring them together in the same uh, Git repository. The scheduler absolutely can be the same piece of software. Uh, we have separate schedules today. Um, no reason to have a separate scheduler. You should be able to schedule both your functional and your performance tests from the same scheduler. We do see certain hardware always being different. The UI hardware uh, has one set of specifications and the load test has a different. Uh, but certainly storing, analyzing of these results and displaying together in one dashboard is something we, we can be done as well. So another area to look at. So quick summary. Constantly look for opportunities to shift up the functional and performance automated testing as I went through this presentation. Utilize your dev or your test or automated functional tests for single user performance testing. Again, I think that's a really big win, great place to start. Minimally try to correlate your, your UI automated functional tests with your automated protocol load tests. And we're trying to take it one step further by having those scripts uh, coming from one uh, domain specific script. And also look at your, your tools and your infrastructure. Minimize cost of building, maintaining, executing, and reporting automated functional and automated performance tests. So in other words, don't try to keep them separate. Uh, and the, the poll I gave earlier, it showed a big difference from the functional experience to performance. And in general, the performance is lagging. And I wouldn't let it lag too far or you have to play catch up. So I would step back now if you can, and say what can we do for some early wins in our performance to bring it at the same level as our functional test? And with all this, you want to integrate it into your CD uh, pipeline. You want to gate it as much as you can.